Sangam Age, Administration, Part 2 The Royal Court and Council The Royal Court was the seat of highest and supreme administration. The King and his council are the members of the Royal Court. They were constituted by the representatives of the people, like the chief priest, physicians and astrologers. These councils safeguarded the rights and privileges of the people. The priest was looking after the religious ceremonies. The physicians were in charge of the health of the ruler and his subjects. The astrologers were to fix the auspicious hours for public ceremonies and to predict the important events. The court of the king was called a vi, which is known as Arukai, Olakam, or Vetavai. The king's court was also called Arasavai. The king and queen appeared in the court in pompous customs and costly ornaments. The scepter, white umbrella and the throne kept the king separate and in elevated position in the court. The members of the council in theory advised the king but in practice received orders from the king. Yet they never failed to give advice when it was needed. There are a number of instances in the Sangam literature that the learned men had warned the king when he taxed the people more and dragged the country to endless warfare. The royal court was not the law-making body. Every command of the king was a law. The king respected conventions and usages. He was the guardian of law rather than the maker of it. During the post-Sangam period the king was assisted by the council called Amparunkulu and Enparayam. The post-Sangam texts Salapathakaram and Manamekalai speak about the councils. A detailed description of the constitution, function and powers of those councils are given in the post-Sangam texts. The Amparunkulu according to Nachanarkiniyar consists of Amayachachar, ministers, Purohatar, chief priests, Senapati, army chiefs, Dutar, envoys, and Orar, spies. As for the Enparayam Nachanarkiniyar says Karanathialvar, Karumakarar, Kanakasutram, Kadaikapalar, Nagaramandar, Padaitalivar, Yunai Virar and Ivyalai Maravar. We get references to Narparamkulu, the four great groups in the Madurai Kanchi. Administration during the Sangam Age. Central Administration. The king was the very center and embodiment of administration. He was called Ko, Manan, Vendan, Koravan or Raven. Though hereditary monarchy was the prevailing form of government, disputed successions and civil wars were not unknown. In the central administrative machinery the king was the fountainhead. He was assisted by a large body of officials, who were divided into five assemblies, Amparamkulu, namely Amayachachar, minister, Purohatar, priest, Senapatiar, army chief, Dutar, envoy, and Orar, spies, Amayachachar. The Amayachachar or minister was a very important official looked after the various administrative unit of the state. The king employed many ministers and their duties were advisory. They were present in the court and advised the king in matters on which they were consulted. Thiravaluvar in his Thirukural calls the ministers as Amayachachar and Ulai Irandar. Kadialur Yeruthiram Kananar calls them as Amayachachar and Sutram. The post Sangam works Salapathakaram and Thirukural make reference to ministers of various administrative units. The ministers were famed because they were strangers to falsehood. It was their nature to give good and wise advice to the kings. Purohatar. The Purohatar of the king's court were called Asan or Karuma Vinanainer and Danners. All the rulers of the Sangam period had Purohatar in their court. The kings respected them and seek their advice in the emergency situations. A Chola king who once so far forgot himself to offend such a Purohatar promptly expressed his regret and the poet had the good grace to appreciate the character of the prince. Senapatiar. The Senapatiar or Senapati was important official, who controlled and administered the army force of the state. Under his control the army like infantry, the cavalry, the elephantry, and the chariotry actively participated in warfare for the safeguard of the state. The Senapati who rallied the army around the banner and he continued the fight under his leadership. The Senapatis were so brave that they did not care even if arrows fell on them, even if the elephants attacked them. These brave army chief were notable for a great quality and they were very courageous in the battlefield. Dutar. The Dutar or ambassadors were representatives of one king in the court of another king. The chief qualification of an ideal Dutar were pleasing manners, coming of a high family, kindness, expressiveness, a good and stately figure, 
a good and high standard of education, ability to time his message without betraying fear or showing favor and courage in the face of certain death. Due to was a normal political activity, but they were busy during the wartime. Nachinarkin E.R. says, the ministers, the priests, the generals, the envoys, and the spies are the five great advisors, were busy in the execution of the central administration. In Sangam literature there are evidences to Dutar and their activities. The most familiar instance of Dutar in the Sangam period is Auvai's Dutu to Adiyaman Nediman Anji. Parananuru gives many instances of Kovarkalar's attempts to subdue royal anger and bringing about reconciliation. It appears that the ambassadors were not permanently assigned to foreign courts with regular routine of political activity but were chosen and employed only when and if the need arose. Or are. The spies were employed by the king in large numbers. The spies of royal king were called Orar and espionage was called Vivu or Ora. The slight distinction between Vivu and Ora, the former is the report of the spies and while the later refers to the act of espionage. Mostly the spies were employed during the wartime. Not only during wartime but also during peace the spies were employed. The commentator Nachinarkiniar notes that when spies brought information from enemy ranks they were liberally rewarded. Sometimes Dutar also employed as Orar. It may be maintained that officially the Dutar were considered superior to the Orar and that while King looked upon Dutar as part of his court he considered the Orar as part of his personal guards and information service. Administrative Division During the Sangam age each kingdom was divided into different administrative units. Their divisions were Mandalam, Nadu, Valanadu and Ur. The entire kingdom was called Mandalam. There were major Mandalams viz. The Chola Mandalam, the Pandya Mandalam and the Shara Mandalam, which indicates the geopolitical divisions of the Sangam dynasties. Nachanarkiniar speaks of the four divisions of Tamil country the Shara, Chola, Pandya and Tandai Mandalams. Below the Mandalam was a major division was Nadu, province. The administration of Nadus was generally carried on by hereditary chiefs. The Ur was a village which variously described as a big village, Purur, a small village, Surur, or an old village, Mudur. Patanam was the name for a coastal town and Pahar was the harbor area. Kaverapampatanam was generally known simply as Patanam, which was the most popular coastal town, involved in export and import during the Chola period. There were many commercial as well as political centers mentioned in the Sangam texts, namely Pahar, Urayur, Korkai, Madurai, Musiri, Vanji or Karar, and Kanchipuram. Among these we get detailed account of Pahar, Madurai and Kanchipuram. It can be noted that the account of Madurai in Madurai Kanchi and that of Pahar in Patanapalai are all stereotyped and do not much different from each other. Village Administration The village was the fundamental unit of administration. Generally the village managed its own affairs. Generally the term, Ur, stands for village. The village affairs were managed by Manram, Padail, Ambalam and Uravai. The Manram, General Assembly, and Padail and the Ambalam seem to synonymous terms, and one understands that the small village met there to transact local business. K. A. Nilakanta Sastri treats the Manram as a hall and the Padail as a common place. The commentator says Manram the foot of the tree in the center of the village for the people to come and sit down and equates Padail with Ambalam. The commentator says Manram the foot of the tree in the center of the village for the people to come and sit down and equates Padail with Ambalam. The word Ambalam is meaning by a small building on a slightly raised platform. The term, Padail, is derived from, Podu, and, Il, meaning commonplace. Nachanarkiniar explains Padail also as a place where any body could worship. The Padail was cleaned with cow dung paste and captive women were made to look after the maintenance. It was a village site, generally outside it usually under a tree where people assembled to take rest, to chatter inconsequentially, to talk responsible politics, to constitute the forum for village opinion for politico-judicial purposes. The, the foot of the Margosa tree supplied an ideal venue for the Manram as it is well known for its medicinal qualities. The village institutions of Manram and Padail were concerned mainly with the arbitration of petty disputes arising in the villages. They had more powers because there was no hierarchy of officials to whom appeals could be made and necessarily village elders exercised ample powers. 
The village elders were not selected or elected. The people chose themselves and as they were aged, influential and perhaps rich the others rarely objected to it. Revenue Administration In the Sangam age, various kinds of taxes were known and collected. Out of that revenue, the king incurred his private and public expenditures. A number of officials were appointed by the king to look after the revenue affairs. The king levied the various taxes according to the customs. Unjust and unusual taxation, the demand for forced gifts, etc. were not approved. Among the revenue of the state land revenue was the chief source of income. The land tax was called arai or karai, but the share of the agricultural produces, claimed and collected by the king, is not specified. The water charge was also levied from the farmers to whom water was supplied from the reservoirs or canals for irrigation. Other important sources of income of the state were tolls and customs duties, which were called as ulgu or sungam. The tolls and the customs were levied at all the seaports. Mainly the tolls were collected on the trunk roads and at the frontiers of the kingdom. The tributes paid by the vassal chiefs and princes, the booty obtained during expeditions and the profits out of the forests, fisheries, and elephants of the state also formed the income of the state. Booty captured in wars was also a major income to the royal treasury. Administration of justice. The king was the repository of all secular power and was therefore the source of justice. He meted out justice with the help of the ministers and pirohatars. It appears that the courtyard of the palace where the king's official court met, also served as a court of justice. Complaints were heard and inquired into and cases were decided. The Tamils of the Sangam age had most of the simple paraphernalia required to maintain a judicial system. There was sense of justice and administration of justice during the Sangam period. The king's court was called a vai, which was the highest court of justice. In the king's court learned men were assisted the king in judicial administration. The village court of justice was Manram, where the village-level problems were settled by the elders of the society. A clear division was made between civil and criminal cases. The criminal cases were decided with the aid of witness. The procedure was simple and justice was accessible to the entire population. The primitive system of trial by ordeal existed. Though it is not appealing to modern reasoning, it was applied on the firm faith in supernatural help or participation. The punishments were very severe. It was disciplinary in nature. Exclusion and similar punishments were very common. Death penalty was given even for theft. Imprisonments and fines were minor punishments. This system though cruel in nature was effective in results. The threat of severe punishments is a standing warning, where voluntary submission to law is paucity. Warfare. Warfare was a major occupation of the ruling classes of the Sangam period. Generally war started with the well-known incident cattle fighting. The incident was both a protest and a justification. There was no dearth of wars in the Sangam age. The kings maintained armies and weapons necessary for it. The art of warfare was very advanced. Methods of attack and defense were many and well defined, well understood and well practiced. The army was the mainstay of the royal might. The king was an integral part of the army. They spend their most of their revenue for the maintenance of the army. Apparently out of the taxes collected from the peasantry and other sources, the state maintained a rudimentary army and it consisted of chariots drawn by oxen, of elephants, cavalry and infantry. Elephants played an important part in war. Horses were imported by sea into the Pandian kingdom. The institution of Varakal or Nadukal, hero stone, which was a practice of erecting monuments for the dead soldiers and worshipping them, was prevalent at that time. The institution of Kavalmaram or Kadimaram was also prevalent. Under it, each ruler had a great tree in his palace as a symbol of power. Summary. The political history of the ancient Tamilicum starts from the Sangam period. The three ancient Tamil empires the Shara, the Chola and the Pandya ruled Tamilicum roughly from the 3rd century BC to the 3rd century AD. Together they ruled over the Tamil land with unique culture and language, contributed to the growth of some of the oldest extant literature in the world. These three dynasties were in constant struggle with each other vying for hegemony over the land. The entry of the Calabras during the 3rd century AD disturbed the traditional order of the day by displacing the three ruling kingdoms. From about 300 AD, 
to 600 AD, there is an almost total lack of information regarding occurrences in the Tamil land. The Calabras are described in the latter literature as evil rulers, who overthrew the established Tamil kings and got a strong hold of the country. The tradition about the evils of the Calabra in Rhodes has been interpreted as a social crisis, which led to the disappearance of the characteristic institutions of the time. Thank you.